so it was the summer of my 19th year. I'd just finished my first year of college. I'd worked at home for the summer, and at the end of the season, my college roommates' family invited me to join them for a few days up at Jekyll Island. Wow. They'd rented a house right near the beach. It was glorious. In fact, my roommate, Luann, and I took full advantage of being there on the beach, which is probably why I spend so much time at the dermatologist these days, at this stage of my life. Well, this one night, we went for a walk, and it was one of those perfect nights. I mean, the breeze was so gentle and cool. The moon was absolutely full, and we walked, and we walked, and the conversation was deep and sweet and meaningful, and it was so easy for us to proclaim with the psalmist, O Lord our God. How majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yes, our conversation continued and we began to talk about God and our place in relationship to God, the creator, and with this whole beautiful world in which we lived. It was one of those very sweet conversations that I have remembered all these years, because sadly, Luann died when she was 50 of ALS. And this night was one of those nights where God was in our midst. It was beautiful. We sat in silence for a long time, right on the edge of the beach. And then we realized that creation was happening all around us. And we realized that we were witnessing a silent ritual that has been going on for millions of years as little baby sea turtles. Hatchlings started to break out of their nest, emerge to life, and make their way to the sea. It was holy. It was sacred. It was a mysterious gift of God's beauty. Through the years, I have wondered about those baby sea turtles, wondered how many of them made it to adulthood, wondered if any of them are still alive because you know, they have a lifespan of much like humans. And I was so grateful to be there for their beginning. Today, we are beginning. <coughs> beginning our journey together of reading through the Bible as a community, looking at the truths that the book holds and realizing what a difference it makes in our lives. I am really grateful that so many of you are joining us on this journey, and if you want to get catch on board, we want you to join us. Would you pray with me? Oh, loving God, startle us with your truth. Speak your saving and liberating word to us this day, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So here we are, reading the stories of the faith, the stories of our tradition that we affirm and proclaim, and we are starting at the very beginning of the Bible. The point or main theme of today is God, and God's creation are bound together in a distinct and delicate fashion. Before I go any farther, I want to take a moment to thank Matt Hotho and Steve Crawford and Jim Harnish, who, who prepared an awesome podcast on the early chapters of Genesis, if you want to listen to it. I also want to thank a bunch of commentary writers that I read this week, and especially Walter Brueggemann, who wrote a really seminal work on Genesis. Not only does Brueggemann say that God and God's creation are bound together in a delicate and distinct way, he also says that the presupposition, the assumption, it is the belief for everything that is going to follow in the Bible. So as we begin this journey of the whole scripture, let us always keep in mind the beginning of the scriptures, these first few chapters of Genesis, because everything we'll read in these following pages, we'll connect back to the beginning. 
and they remind us that God is a God of goodness, a God of beauty, a God of order. And God will stop at nothing to get us back to the garden. God will stop at nothing to right the relationship between us and God, between us and one another, between us and the earth. The opening of Genesis helps to establish, and it clearly sets the tone of how we understand God as one universal God who creates, sustains, orders, provides, preserves, and loves. In the beginning, God. Now, if you have been reading with us this week, and you're really closely reading, you begin to notice, though, that there's not just one story of creation. The very next chapter, you have a little different version of creation. One where humans are created uh, after plants and animals, and another version where they're created beforehand. And in that version, Adam is asked to name all the plants and animals. I wonder. Do you think he used the common name, or was it a genus and species, you know? For every little amoeba, do you, you know, you begin to wonder about these things, right? We can get off on some rabbit trails. And then you read a little more, and you realize there are two records of the generations from the creation to the flood. And if you go on a little farther, you realize that you've read something, and you think, I think I read that yesterday in our reading, because there are a few things that repeat themselves. Unfortunately, this is where many people get bogged down. They get confused and they quit because they're trying to interpret the Bible, all of the Bible, as one single literal story. Friends, I want to say to you, it's not a science book. It's not a textbook. It's not a history book exactly. And if we try to force it to be history and geology and biology, then I think we're missing something. If we're trying to make it a literal, documentable, provable fact, then we misunderstand it and we misuse it. Jim Harnish, I think, coined the phrase, but you've often heard it around here at Hyde Park, we take the Bible very seriously. But we do not take it literally. And there is a little difference there. The Bible helps us understand God and God's relationship with us, God's creation. And some of the things that are so amazing and cool about this book is that it's like it's written with a chorus of voices, not just one voice. There are so many different books and authors and times that the whole scriptures contain. There are various stories, and all these stories are genuine marks that show that the book of Genesis was not written at one time by one person with one pen but it is a collection of multiple traditions of the beginnings of Israel, the people of Israel, and it comes from different sources and different authors. So let me put it another way. Bill Barnes is a retired pastor over in Orlando. He was at St. Luke's in Windermere. And he said, you know, probably all of us have been to some large intergenerational family gathering, and inevitably, maybe a holiday meal, and inevitably somebody, your grandfather, might start to tell a story. And then someone else, maybe his wife, perhaps, will say, oh, no, no, it wasn't like that. It was really like this. You got that. And then someone else will add another little detail to, uh-huh, I see some knowing looks here. Yes, it, we <clears throat> confess in our, in our household this happens. And so we interrupt and we correct and we add on. And we, as members of the family, don't have to choose, well, I want Uncle Henry's version, and I'm going to stick with that. We realize that all their this perspectives on the family story are make it more valuable and more full truth. We know that the meaning is deeper than the individual stories and the multiple voices add to the family's truth. The Bible is our family story. We as Christians, as people of faith. You see, for hundreds of years, these stories were written, were not written down, they were passed on by oral tradition. Now imagine gathering around the family campfire and telling your children and grandchildren how God created you, made you special, made you in the very image of our creator. 
These stories are written often in poetic narrative, and we believe they were used in liturgy, in worship, so that they were repeated over and over, and the whole family could understand the family story. We now believe that the written word of Genesis was actually penned, finally written down in around 6 BC, at the time when a community of Jews were absolutely in captivity in Babylon. It was a dark time for the people of Israel who were trying to make sense of their very difficult situation. They had lost everything. They had been carted off to a foreign land with foreign gods and everything seemed to have fallen apart. No doubt they felt utterly hopeless and abandoned and forsaken. Surely they were questioning their faith and wondering where in the world God was or maybe even wondering if there was a God. Professor Brueggemann says that the Genesis creation story was written down to evoke faith and trust for a community of desperate people. Genesis is a life-saving, life-affirming confession. The reality of God is good news. The reality of God is life-saving news to oppressed people in all ages, way back then, and definitely for us today. That is good news. The whole text speaks a word of hope to a people who had given up hope. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and, and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God is the creator. The world belongs to God, and we are part of the creation. We are a very special part. We're humans, and we humans are made in the image of God. We are God's agents and we are co-creators with God. We are not able to do it by ourselves. We need God, but God has put a spark of the divine in you. A spark of the divine in you, in every one whom you meet. We're co-creators with God. When we're in the best, when we're doing our best in right relationship with God and one another, we are creating something that is of God. But we are human. And we have fallen away many times. We are to farm the land, yes, and take care of it and be good stewards of it and have dominion over it and protect it and tend to it. We're not to dominate it. We're to tend to it and care for it. For this creation, this whole project, it's extremely good. God says that over and over. It's not original sin. It's original goodness. God rejoices and delights in the beauty and the goodness of creation, and we human beings are made in that image, and we are supposed to be working with God on God's team. Or maybe this week, then, if you think about that, maybe you could do your part to add just a little more beauty, a little more goodness into this world that could certainly use it. Or you might ask, how do we do that? Sometimes it's overwhelming when we look at the world and we hear about climate change and global warming. But there are so many things that we as individuals can do, large and small. So let's go back to those baby sea turtles that I saw on the beach nearly 40 years ago. There are some real threats these days to sea turtles. Plastic pollution is a huge problem. With some 8 million metric tons, that's a lot of plastic pollution going into the ocean every year. Discarded plastic bags and balloons that we let go in the sky, they often find their way in streams and lakes that eventually find their way to the ocean. And sea turtles and other wildlife are choking on them, literally choking on them. So what can we do? What can we do? What can I do? What can you do? There are many things we can do to reduce plastic pollution. For starters, we could maybe stop letting go of those balloons in the sky. There's no, okay, it's a nice, beautiful thing for a second, but it, it's not good long term. 
We could stop using plastic straws at home and at restaurants. We could use reusable cups. We could take our own bags to the grocery store, right? Reusable bags. We could bring our own containers when we get takeout food, or even at the restaurant, if you think you might have leftovers, bring your Tupperware. I know that's plastic. Maybe bring your glassware <laughs> and, and take it with you into the restaurant. They don't care, but that's just another little thing. Or when you have a choice, maybe choose something that has a lot less packaging around it. And if you are a fisher person, make sure, <laughs> make sure that uh, you dispose of your fishing gear properly, including those little <clears throat> six-pack rings for your Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. Make sure you dispose of those because animals are choking on those. The other day I was in the grocery store and there were some young adults uh, purchasing beer and I said, have you ever tried that beer? I'd never seen it. It had this pretty wild fish on it. And uh, I, they said, no. I said, well, what made you choose that? And they said, it has biodegradable six-pack rings. Okay, well, that was a good reason to choose it. Young adults are continuing to teach me that I need a smaller carbon footprint on this earth, that we all do, that we need to reduce, reuse, and recycle. You know that. We've been saying it for years, but we really do. It's critical. We are at a critical stage, and we need to be better stewards of this beautiful creation that God has gifted us with. So out of nowhere... Time, space, and all living things whirl forth as God speaks the universe into existence. With the utterance of God's voice, creation takes form. Chaos yields to order. Light eclipses darkness, and emptiness fills with life. And not long after, God creates the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve. The story takes a tragic turn when the couple the first couple, disobey. The clear instruction from God not to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And as a result, humanity falls from God's intended perfection. The disastrous consequences of this decisive act are demonstrated in Cain's murder of Abel, in Noah and the flood. And if we think about that story, it's a, it's a very painful story. But really, it's about a time when creation had gone awry. Creation had turned their back on God and were living in evil. And so God chooses to take this drastic action. But Brueggemann says it is not a story of God's anger, but rather it's about God's sadness, his grief over the brokenness in this world. It is not an angry tyrant, but a troubled parent, not an enraged parent, but a sad one. And this God is a God of second chances, which he gives to humanity at that time. And then if you've been reading this week, you come on to that story of the Tower of Babel. That's another confusing one. And it was because God had said, go out, be fruitful and multiply. Go out into the world and tend to it and care for it. But humans decided to stick together and pile on top of one another and build a tower to get up close to God. And God didn't want that. He wanted them out tending for the creation. And so he divided their language. He mixed them. He confused their language so they couldn't understand each other. So they came down and they went out. Disastrous consequences happen when we mess up our relationship with God and one another. But we must remember that God's ultimate choice, his prize is this new creation, this one who has the sound and heartbeat of God, human beings made in God's image. The human family is to join with God and be co-creators in this world, even now, yes now, today. The earth below and the sky above and all their inhabitants are too beautiful and too good to be taken advantage of and to be left alone. They need the tender care. They need the close attention that only humans can provide. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name. 
in all the earth. So give us eyes to see the beauty of your creation. Give us ears to hear the music that you play for us. Give us the senses to know the goodness of all you have made. And definitely give us the courage to be better stewards of this earth. We pray in your name. Amen.